We're going to turn to Luke chapter 24. And we're going to read a couple verses of scripture here, starting at verse 45. Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 45. And uh, from here today, I want to talk about something. Been in my spirit all week long. And um, the uh, United Pentecostal uh, Church General Conference was in Indianapolis this week. And um, I was unable to, to attend uh, because of all sorts of stuff been going on in September and a busy month and wasn't able to go. And uh, next, next year, I'm going to do my best to go. It was an incredible time. You can view those services on uh, YouTube. They're archived under the channel there, the UPC channel, and uh, just powerful words of God and, and strengthened and encouraged my soul. And um, I heard one of the preachers talking on Friday night about something that he was touching on what I planned on talking about today. And so uh, it, it just kind of sealed the deal. But, um, you know, it, I, one thing my wife and I were talking about when we were watching these, um, these, these services and these messages and such was, and even in the worship, where, you know, you're, you're watching it and you're like, you know, it, 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 it's just not the same as being in person because we're like, man, it seems like people are just going crazy there. I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't feel that. That's the difference between viewing online and being in person. You, you can feel the Holy Ghost through a video, but it's not the same as being in person. It, the body of Christ is when we gather together. That is the what you would call the temple of God, if you will. That's what this New Testament teaches, that he's building. He's building his habitation, which are his people. And when we gather together, there's nothing like it. That's why it's important to come to church. That's why it's important to consistently come to church and be plugged in, rooted and grounded in a local body of Christ, the local church. That The local church is the hope for a city because that is Christ's body it's his hands at his feet through which his spirit works that's why the book of Revelation say the spirit and the bride say come and I don't want to say something different than what the spirit of God is saying and I don't want to do something different or go somewhere different than where the spirit of God is heading I want to be in that flow and in that will and direction uh, if you believe that, say amen. <clears throat> We're going to read from Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 45 today. And it says, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Wouldn't that be nice? He opened their understanding to understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. What name do you think that verse is referring to? Say it a little louder. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. Everybody say all nations. But it has a starting point and it says beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry. Everybody say tarry. Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until, everyone say until, you be endued or clothed with power from on high. Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. I want to preach to us today from this title, Pentecost is Coming. Pentecost is Coming. Let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to speak to us through his word today. Father, we love you. We thank you for your presence that is here and your word that never returns void. Father, your word is forever settled. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your words will not pass away. I pray today that you would confirm your word with signs following. Father, I ask today that you would minister to somebody's life in this house today. If they need a healing in their body, I pray God give them faith to believe for that healing. 
If they need to repent of their sins, I pray, God, convict them through your word that they would repent from their sins. Whatever the need is, whatever the situation is today, God, I pray that we would leave here different than how we came. And I pray that you would receive all the glory. We take authority in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One more time, clap your hands mightily to the Lord. Let's give him praise. If you believe that God is good, somebody just shout amen. You can be seated. It had been, oh, probably three or four thousand year process from the first messianic prophecy given by God himself in Genesis 3 about one coming from the seed of a woman who would crush the head of the serpent to messianic types or figures that would rise up all throughout the Old Testament. Men such as Joseph or Moses, Joshua, David, the list goes on. Men who um, reflect the role or the nature of the Messiah, but they were not the Messiah. Joseph goes down into Egypt to make a way for the people of God to be preserved. Uh, descends into a pit, comes out, and preserves a nation. Moses going into Egypt to lead God's people out of Egypt. Passing through the Red Sea, being led by a cloud, which Paul tells us in his letter to the Corinthians that passing through the Red Sea is a type of baptism and the cloud being behind and before them is a type of the spirit infilling uh, glimpses and clues and patterns and shadows and principles all throughout the Old Testament that what we are a part of today in this New Testament church has always been a part of the plan of God. That Abraham longed to see the day that Jesus would come. And Jesus says Abraham did see it. And, and we, we find these glimpses of things. And uh, so the Jews were looking for their Messiah for thousands of years. And prophecies would be given. And they would look and they would hope. Life would become very difficult and challenging and surrounded by polytheistic cultures and nations that believed in more than one God. They were surrounded by this influence, yet their bedrock belief is what we call Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. They believed in only one God and they were different than everyone else. And they were a minority. The nation of Israel, I heard it said the other day, is only approximately 16 miles wide. It's relative to the size of New Jersey, perhaps. Or it's, it is smaller than Scotland. And you hear about this nation of Israel, and they have figures throughout time that are infamous, such as David the giant killer. They had prophets that would prophesy to kings and would prophesy about the coming of a king, a Messiah. And the people of Israel longed for their Messiah to come. They prayed and hoped for their Messiah to come. And for thousands of years they looked for it and as they are looking for their Messiah and they are studying the prophecies and the scriptures, they are looking for one that more and more in their mind is someone who will come and deliver them of their natural temporal condition, that their physical condition, that their political condition, the the 
the view of Messiah moved from being what Scripture said he would be to a political military figure who would overthrow the Roman Empire. This is right before Jesus' day now. And they are looking for one who will ascend to the natural, physical throne of Israel and make Israel into a powerful nation and a world uh, ruling force once again. They are looking at their Messiah through natural eyes. And yet we find that in the Gospels, at the beginning of our New Testament Bible that there is one who comes whose birth was prophesied of old Isaiah said unto us a child is born unto us a son is given the government shall be upon his shoulders his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty God the everlasting father the prince of peace Isaiah says that This child will be born of a virgin and he will be called Emmanuel, which is God with us. And yet Isaiah also says that this Messiah figure would be a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. We esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. We hid as if it were our faces from him. Uh, This Messiah figure doesn't seem very powerful, doesn't seem very uh, militant. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief, pierced for us, bruised for us. His stripes, through his stripes, by his stripes, we are healed. And um, this doesn't sound like a world ruler. This sounds like a man who is treated unjustly, a man who came unto his own, but his own received him not. This sounds a lot more like a man who uh, received something that he did not deserve. And that, that is the picture of the Messiah. We find in the Gospel of John that some of Jesus' followers come and Andrew finds his brother, Simon, or Peter. And in verse 41 of John chapter 1, it's talking about Andrew. It says, He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. We have found him. Imagine what's going through Andrew's Mind. What you have to understand is that they had been finding messiahs for years, generations. Figures would rise up and they would think he is the one. And there was even a messiah figure that rose up. And uh, Josephus, a Jewish historian, records about this man that uh, just a generation or so before Jesus uh, came onto the scene, this figure rose up and led a revolt against Rome, and he was brutally crucified. And he died. But history proves he didn't rise again. What you and I have to understand is that this Messiah terminology has been going on for uh, generations, and, and men would rise up and they would, is, is he the one? Is, is, is he the real Messiah? And Time would go on and prove he was not the real Messiah. John the Baptist was questioned, are you the Messiah? He said, I am not the Christ. I am just preparing the way for him. Uh, John the Baptist introduced Jesus to the crowd. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. It's funny describing Jesus in so many different facets. He is the Lamb of God. He's also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. It's this collage, this picture that is painted in Scripture to reveal who Jesus is. And they're looking for the Messiah. And Philip, another one of Jesus' disciples, comes and he has found the Messiah. And he goes and he tells his friend, 
Nathanael. He goes to him in verse 45. Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him, him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. We found him, and his name is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. What's so powerful about this is that Philip found the Messiah in the scriptures. What we have to remember in reading the scriptures and studying history in the time of Jesus is that not everybody found Jesus of Nazareth in the scriptures. Because Jesus of Nazareth was a humble carpenter from a um, looked down upon village. They were poor. They, uh, most uh, Nazarites, Nazarenes, I apologize, Nazarenes, they were so poor that they slept with their animals, that they didn't have enough money to have a separate space for their animals, that their home, there was a section that would be blocked off, that the animals would stay there, and in another section of their home, uh, that they would live. And, and some will say, well, that's not much different. I mean, my dog sleeps with me. We're not talking about dogs and cats. We're talking about donkeys and sheep. Now, I don't, you, you may have a pet sheep that lives in your house, and if that's your business, I mean, that's your business. You know, there's no scripture against it, so I'm, I'm, I won't rebuke you. <laughs> there's nothing, well, I'll, I'll leave it. Uh, there, there's nothing, you know, I mean, if you have a donkey that lives in your house, I'm trying to be careful. <laughs> I'll just move on. You picked up what I was throwing down. Uh, you know, it's just, that's your business. But I'm, I'm telling you today that these people lived in an area that uh, did not look like it would produce a king of the Jews. And Jesus did not come with power and might. He came lowly in a manger. What king is born in a manger? He's typically born in a palace, but he's not. This Jesus was not. And yet, this Jesus fulfilled scripture that even Malachi talks about and Micah talks about. And, and all of the prophets of the Old Testament touch on this Messiah who would come. And when you look at the life of Jesus, he fulfilled it all. But we look in hindsight but the followers of Jesus were looking in their very present and they had been studying scripture Messiah and when he came they recognized him that is powerful that is very powerful to understand they did what Paul talks about rightly dividing the word of of truth. You can know scripture. That doesn't mean you understand it. You can quote scripture. That doesn't mean you have the revelation of scripture. Because I want to remind you today that the religious leaders of Jesus' day had another figure in their mind of who Messiah would be. And when the real Messiah walked onto the scene, they rejected him over and over and over again. Nicodemus was intrigued. Joseph of Arimathea was intrigued. They followed Jesus privately because of fear of their order that they were a part of. But it was Joseph and Nicodemus that made it possible for Jesus to be buried in a borrowed tomb. Thus fulfilling another prophecy of the Messiah. Uh, and and they, so what we see here is that can you recognize the Jesus of Scripture? Uh, that, that's what we have to challenge ourselves with today. That the Messiah walks onto the scene and Andrew and Philip recognize him. They find him in Scripture. That's a big deal. That's something we can't gloss over today. You see, we have 2,000 years of different 
versions of Christianity that we can conclude that Jesus was the Messiah. And, and some of us just believe Jesus was the Messiah because somebody said he is. But my question today is, is that when you read this book, have you come to the conclusion that Jesus truly is the only one that has the power and the ability to save you from your sin? It's a powerful truth we have to understand. Uh, Philip found Jesus in the scriptures. Even students of scripture did not find Jesus in scripture. Why? Because their interpretation of scripture blinded them from the revelation of scripture. I heard somebody say this the other day. It, and it, revelation and deception feel the same. Because even the serpent deceived Eve. But in that moment, it felt like revelation. I will not die. I will be like God. But that's not what God said. Revelation and deception, the difference between them, how was it revealed? Through the word of God. It's through the word of God. You see, the religious leaders in Jesus' day, they had this preconceived idea of who the Messiah would be. And so therefore, when the real thing came before them, they rejected him. But not everybody. Because those who were looking, hoping for the real thing, when the real thing came, they recognized him. I worked at a bank, different roles, and we had to be able to distinguish the difference between counterfeit bills and real ones. Now, they, they give you a little pen, you check it, and that's easy. But the best way to determine whether or not a it's a counterfeit bill or a real bill, bill is to just constantly associate yourself with the real thing. Because when you're constantly handling the real thing, when a fraud shows up, this doesn't feel right. This doesn't feel, it looks the same. I mean, they've got counterfeit bills now that can look, I mean, you have to have a very trained eye to tell the difference, but well, this feels off. There's something off. It's not as weighty. It doesn't have the same texture. You can tell the difference between the real and the fake. And if it's fake, it's false. And if it's false, it's not true. And if it's not true, it's not of God. How do you want to know the real thing? You need to associate yourself with the real thing. And so the disciples of Jesus, whose society, they're just common, ordinary men. They're just regular guys. It doesn't matter what society thought of them. They had a hunger for truth. They studied the scriptures and they saw and recognized the Messiah when he came. What I'm wanting us to understand today is that must be us today. That must be who we are. That must be what we desire. Search the scriptures and find Jesus. Not what somebody says about Jesus. What the scripture says about Jesus. Not what somebody says about salvation. What the scripture says about salvation. Not what somebody says about holiness. What the scripture says about a holy lifestyle. What does God say in his word to us and for us? Because the only thing we answer to when we stand before him one day is his word. It's not a pastor that will judge you, although I will give an account for you. But yet it is the word of God that measures us. It is the word of God that will look at our life and say, here was the Bible. What did you do with what was given to you? How did you live with what was made available to you? 
Well, somebody said this is all I needed to do. That person is not God and that person is not a Bible. This is the forever settled word of God. This is what we answer to. This is what will judge us. My question today is, are you willing to have eyes that will see? And are you willing to have ears that will hear? Because Jesus over and over again told parables and, 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 and communicated truths of the kingdom. And he then said, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear. Jesus didn't plead with people. He didn't beg with people. He says, if you have an ear to hear the truth, you will hear the truth. My question today for every single person in this room, how are your ears? Do you have ears that want to hear truth? Or do you have ears that just want to be tickled by somebody that will tell you you're all right? This is the word of God that we must answer to. And it, the reason why I preach this today is because I care for every person in these pews every person in this building and I have a mandate from God as a man of God to preach the truth my question today is do you have ears to hear people will flock to hear a preacher say something that makes them feel good that's why there's mega churches all over the place. And I go and I hear those sermons and I listen to what they're saying. And there's nothing that convicts my heart. And there's nothing that makes me want to draw closer to Jesus. It's you, you can live your best life now. Not everyone's living their best life now. You want to live your best life, it's going to be in heaven. Why? Because old things will pass away. Every tear will be dried from our eyes. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more sin. There'll be no more darkness because the Lamb will be the light in that city. That sounds like the best life if you're asking me. You don't have to worry about betrayal and hardship and sickness and sorrow and hard times. You don't have to worry about that in heaven. That's the best life. That's the life Jesus came to give us. That's the door that he has made available for us to walk through. But the only way to get there is through him because he is the door. But he's not just the door. He's the shepherd. And he's not just the shepherd. He is the way. And he's not just the way, he's the truth. And he's not just the truth, he's the life. What is Jesus? He is everything. He is everything you need. He is the only hope, but he's the only hope you need. Let's give him praise in this house. Tell Jesus how good he is. Yet Jesus loves us. We know that. But sometimes I fear that us believing that he loves us causes us to not strive for more. Jesus loves me. That's all I need. I'm good. Because Jesus said, if any man wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You know, the hardest thing is to deny yourself because you just can't deny, well, I'm, I'm going to start going to church. That's not denying yourself. Denying yourself is denying your mindset, denying what you thought was true, denying what you think and how you think it should be. Denying ourselves is us denying our will for his denying ourself is us not living a certain way anymore because his word commands us to stop denying ourself is not just doing the minimum so that we can go to heaven denying ourself is denying ourselves completely so that we can have what he's calling us to which means this it may not be a sin but I'm not going to even do anything that appears like evil. I'm not even going to touch the garments spotted by the flesh. I'm not even going to associate with things 
that oppose the nature of my God. That means it, it affects how you think. It affects our motives. It, it affects how we carry ourselves. It affects every aspect of our life, our spirit, our soul, and our body. The inward part of us and the outward part of us. Why? Because we denied ourselves. And that's not convenient. But who said following Jesus is convenient? Now, we, we've talked about things in, in the past about, and, 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 and there are persecutions going on all over the world where people face physical harm. And even their life is threatened. But the church in the United States, now, I'm I'm going to say a very divisive statement, but the true church of Jesus Christ in the United States does face persecution. It hasn't led to physical harm yet. But it is a social pressure that if you're going to walk the straight and narrow in the USA, that you will be sought to be canceled. But that's the first step that leads towards persecution that we read about in Scripture. And What we have to understand is, if we back down now, we'll never make it when the fire gets turned up. We need to know who we are and what we believe now and not waver. You don't find the book of Acts church coexisting. They stood out like a sore thumb. They paid a dear price for it. But guess what? The gospel spread around the whole world. And the world has changed. Which is what brings me to my point today. Jesus' followers saw that he was the Christ. He was the Messiah. And they followed him for three and a half years. And even while they followed him, they didn't quite grasp everything that he said, they really didn't grasp the fact that he told them over and over again, I'm going to die, but three days later I'll rise again. He told them that, I don't know, four or five times that are recorded in the Gospels. And then when it happened, it, it shook them. It rocked their world. They were not able, they all fled in fear. And... Yet, after Jesus rises again from the dead, he gathers his followers again, his 12, plus his other followers at that time. And in our text, it says he opened their understanding to all scripture. Which means that the rest of the New Testament that we read, we can believe it and trust it. Because it was written by Jesus' followers who he opened their understanding to all scripture. That means what they preached about salvation, that's what we do. That's what we practice and preach today. What they preached about a holy lifestyle, that's what we believe and preach and practice today. What they taught about uh, the coming of the Lord, We preach and practice that today, and we prepare for that. And there's many other things. However, Jesus tells them to tarry in Jerusalem until they are endued with power from on high. And this is it. This is the challenge. This is the challenge that Jesus' followers faced in their day. This is the challenge we face in our day. In 1 Corinthians 15, 6, Paul tells us that Jesus appeared to over 500 after his resurrection. 
at one time. 500. Jesus had 12 apostles. We know that he commissioned to be the leaders of his church to spread his gospel. He had female disciples that were very influential and and, an incredible uh, testament to uh, who Jesus was. And he had other followers, and we don't know their names. And we know that Jesus had at least 500 followers. At least. He really had more, but. And after his resurrection, he appeared to over 500. And he tells his disciples in our text to go wait in Jerusalem until they're clothed with power from on high. In the upper room, we only find 120. Where were the other 380? You see, we don't know. And, and I don't want to in, in, interject any opinion into the text. My only question is, is where were the other 380? Do you, do you think it wasn't the will of God for them to not be there? No. There's no way. This is the challenge. This is the word that has been in my spirit all week long. Terry. And the the disciples had been through a lot, seeing Jesus crucified the way he was, and then they thought he was gone, and then three days later he rises again and appears to them. I mean, talk about emotional whiplash. Thought you were dead, now you're not. What are you? Now you're coming through walls. I didn't know that we could do that. Like, that's a whole other discussion, but uh, on on how science proves the, the validity of the resurrected body, but that's... Another rabbit trail we'll get into on a Wednesday night, probably. Um, you know, I, I, if I was one of his followers in that day, I, I, I would be so. I, I you, man, you just talk about the emotional roller coaster in just a week, and then after after Jesus spends forty days on earth after his resurrection and he appears to them and then he disappears and then he comes back and then he meets with them and he opens their understanding to all scripture and then he's like all right I'm ascending I mean me if I'm being honest emotionally I'd need to take a day I need to take a day and they watch him go into heaven and he's gone and he's left them with final instructions and they're just standing there watching him disappear A cloud receives him, and he's gone. And they're just standing there. I mean, what else are you going to do after everything you've been through in a little over a month? (laughs) And uh, finally, two men, we call them angels, appeared and said, Why do you stand here looking into the heavens? Now, this is such a fascinating verse. This same Jesus who you saw go will also come come again in like manner meaning if you could see him going we will see him coming and I'm going to get to my point in a moment but I just want you to pause and think about how cool that is I understand that the last days right before Jesus' return are going to be crazy but how cool will it be to literally watch him descend to the earth as they said you watched him go you will see him come in like manner if you could watch him go there will be people that will be able to see him descending to the earth I know that sounds like some sci-fi movie nowadays but don't let Hollywood blind your faith the word of God says that there will be people that will watch him come to the earth And I think there needs to be something in the people of God. Every day we get up, we look up into the clouds, and we just remind ourselves all over again. Some glad morning when this life is over. You're just going to be able to look up, and that could be the day. So they're watching, and these disciples, these angels tell him this. It doesn't matter what their emotions were. It doesn't matter what they had been through. It doesn't matter anything that they'd experienced or faced in the past 40 days. Jesus told them, 
to go tarry in Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. You know what the word tarry means? To linger with expectation. Isn't that a powerful word? Linger with expectation. Go to Jerusalem and stay there expecting until you get what you're expecting. What am I expecting? Power from on high. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I personally believe that more could have and should have been there. But we do know 120 were there. And they are gathered together in the city that God told them to stay in. And they are doing what Jesus told them to do, tarry. But we know that they weren't going back and living life the way they had always lived. They were consistently and focused in prayer and expectation. They consistently gathered together. That's why they were in an upper room when the Holy Ghost was poured out. And they were in prayer. Scripture says so. They continued steadfastly in prayer. Acts chapter 1. They're praying and they're gathering. Why? Because we're expecting something. Where is it coming from? It's not coming from the earth. It's power from on high. We are gathered together and we are expecting something to fall on us from heaven. And so they kept doing it. And it, day, day three perhaps, maybe they felt something. Maybe they had a good prayer meeting. But it just doesn't feel like what Jesus was talking about. There, there's, he, 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 he opened our understanding to all scripture. And there's something that's going to happen. And so... They keep praying. Perhaps there were more that gathered during that time uh, and, and, and some walked away. We don't know. What we do know is that there was a group of 120 that consistently and steadfastly kept gathering and praying and expecting for something from heaven to hit the city that they were gathered in. I wonder if there's anybody in the room that can see kind of where this is going. They kept staying and they kept praying and they kept expecting until the day for it to be fulfilled came. They're all in one place. They're praying. And all of a sudden there comes a sound. Where did it come from? Heaven. Why? Because it's power from on high that's headed to the earth. And so it fills the house where they're sitting. And they are all filled with the Holy Ghost. And cloven tongues of fire sits upon each of them. And they all speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives them utterance. Now watch this. There are people. It's noised abroad all throughout the city. And there are two groups it's divided into two camps, the city's response to what God had done in that city. One group mocked, the other group marveled. It's the same today. There's one group of people that mock it, and there's another group of people that marvel. I'm interested in the ones who are hungry for what God is sending from heaven. Mock all you want to, but it is power from on high that we need. I can't do this on my own. I don't have power on my own to do what God's called me to do or to live a life pleasing to God. I need something from heaven. And so these mockers say these are just drunk men. Well, the scripture does teach that if you're full of the spirit, it is like you're drunk. But it says, do not be drunk with wine where is it, wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. Wine influences you to do things that you wouldn't do if you're in your right mind. But when you're full of the Spirit, you'll also do things you wouldn't do if you were living in your human mind. You will walk with a boldness. You will walk with a faith. You will walk with a confidence. You will live a life that is overcoming of sin. You will not bow to fear. You will not be discouraged because you are full of the Spirit. And so Peter says, these men are not drunk as you suppose. This isn't what it looks like to your natural mind. But then Peter says what it is. He says, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. 
This is that. I don't want to be a part of a church or go to a church that cannot say that who they are, what they do, what they preach, or they cannot say this is that. If you can't point who you are back to the New Testament church, I don't want to be a part of that. Peter says this is that. This is the fulfillment of prophecy. This is something that's been prophesied for thousands of years. And today, you are seeing the fulfillment and the launching of it. This is that. The Holy Ghost is to be poured out. And just like in the upper room, it's not to just meant to be poured out on a few in the room. The Holy Ghost wants to fill the room and to be poured out on every person in the room. But you know why every person in that upper room was filled with the Holy Ghost? It's because they were lingering with expectation. I want to ask you a question. Why do you come to church? Do you come with expectation or out of a sense of traditional ritualistic Christian duty? Do you come to church with expectation? God's going to do something today. There's something that heaven's going to send our way because we need things from heaven. We need God to move in our midst. We need the encounter of heaven. We need the spirit of God moving in our midst. So this is what happens and they go throughout the rest of the known world and everywhere they go, the Holy Ghost is poured out the same way it's poured out in the upper room. Don't change it. You need to be baptized with the Holy Ghost just like they were in the early New Testament church with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. All over the world today, every minute or so, hundreds and thousands of people are being baptized with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. All over the world today, people are being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, which just may step on some toes today, but you need to hear it. That is the only way they baptized in the Bible. They only baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you the truth today. You should be thankful that somebody is willing to tell you the truth. Because this isn't just a religious preference. This is a heaven or hell thing. It was Jesus who died. It was his blood that was shed. And Peter says, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What name was that? It's the name of Jesus. It's that name that has the power to erase your sin. It's that name that has the power to heal you. It's that name that has the power to transform your life. It is his spirit that it is the will of God that fills you. And it's not something that you just have an encounter and you feel better but when you are filled with the Holy Ghost you will know beyond a shadow of a doubt this is that which I read about in the book of Acts and this is that which was prophesied in the book of Joel that God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh But what you need to understand today is that Peter was saying that what was happening in the book of Acts, yes, is a fulfillment of prophecy. But he also said it shall, future, future, in his day, future, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. We are in the last days. And guess what? God is pouring his spirit out. And guess what? God is about to pour his spirit out in an even greater way than you can imagine. And I'm not talking about we just gather together and feel better. But I'm talking about a demonstration from heaven where people gather. The Holy Ghost falls upon them. They are filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues. They are baptized in the name of Jesus, just like you read about in the Bible. And so what's my point today as I close? The people in the book of Acts did not. The people in the upper room, the people that went and waited in, with expectation in Jerusalem, they did not leave until they experienced and received the real thing. They didn't have a good prayer meeting and say, I feel good. I think that was it. Let's go preach. 
No. I want something to happen in this church that is so powerful we can't explain it. That's what we need. That's what some of us need to be revived out of our complacent Christian situation. That's what some of us need to break us out of the hold that's binding us. That's what this city needs to awaken to the fact that there is a God in heaven whose name is Jesus. He is the one true living God. Let the scales fall from our eyes today. Let the scales fall from this city's eyes today. We need something that shakes this city where some mock and others marvel. What is this? I'll tell you what this is. This is that which the Bible has been saying for thousands of years. It is for you and for your children and to all that are afar off. And so what was being said here is tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Pentecost is coming and you need to wait with expectation until it happens. What am I saying today? I'm telling this church and I'm telling this city Pentecost is coming and we're not settling for anything less. We're not going to compromise so we can grow faster. We'll grow at the rate God wants us to grow and when the real thing hits it's going to shake this city and it will not be able to withstand it. There will be families and people groups and households that are converted. There are Corneliuses in this city who are praying, I want to know the truth. God send us to those people to preach the gospel. They will be filled with the Spirit. They will be baptized in Jesus' name. And they will be forever changed. I'm not looking for something that is a false version. I'm not looking for a counterfeit religion. I'm looking for the real thing that when people walk through those doors, they say, I feel something and it may make some mad and it may make others marvel but you can't deny that what's in this place is different than what you feel in other places and I'm telling you the reason why this is that we believe there is one God and his name is Jesus we believe you need to repent of your sins and follow Jesus we believe you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of those sins and you will receive Receive the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues just like they did in the Bible. If there's anybody in this house that believes that, why don't you just pray? Pray for your family. Pray for your prodigal family members that they come back to God. Pray for your lost family members that the Lord would awaken them. Pray for this city that it would awaken. This may be a different type of Sunday morning service. But if you have a burden in your heart for revival, why don't you go to God in prayer right now? If you want to see the real things sweep through this city, pray. We're not gonna, we're not gonna, we're not gonna change. We're not gonna back down. There's something from heaven that God has ordained, and it's going to come and it's going to hit this city, and it's gonna change people's lives forever.